Hi everyone, thank you for coming. I'm the author. Uh, it's really amazing that you guys came out. This is a labor of love, so I hope you enjoy the book and today. And this is Kate, She'll, I guess she'll introduce herself, but. Okay, um, I'm one of those uh, academics that sometimes writes about scenes and subcultures, and I understand that that's a problematic position to be in, so I'm just gonna be out there about that. Um, and I, just by way of introduction, I wanna say that I, uh, Andy, the, the book's amazing. Um, as someone who grew up in the 1980s, um, I started high school in 1984, and I remember it very clearly, meeting my first two goths. I still remember their names. Their names were Sid Gomez and April Kipsey. And what was kind of incredible, Sid uh, was the son of Portuguese immigrants from the Azores, and I, if I recall, he lived in a townhouse with about 14 other people in one bathroom. And how he got his hair like that in the morning, I'll never know. Um, his, his friend April lived out in the country, and she was tiny and looked like she just walked out of a different century. Um, and she always wore these amazing boots with this huge heel. And what was amazing is because she lived out in the country, she had to drive a, a rusting two-ton Ford pickup truck to school. And we don't know if she had the boots on when she was driving it or not. Um, but what I was looking through um, this compendium of post-punk and goth from the 1980s, it really brought me back to that time. And what's amazing is that because we were living in a really rural place, in northern Canada um, at that time, it's not even like they had access to much music or MTV. And so they were tapping into this subculture um, through zines and through the music. Um, one of the things that I think is great about this book is that as opposed to focusing on just on London, just on New York, just on urban center, you really capture the fact that there was something happening across geographies, across mm -hmm. languages, and that's one of the things that I want to talk about today a bit. Um, first, I'm just going to introduce um, the panelists, and then I have some sort of general questions about terminology um, and um, about style. Uh, and then after about 25 minutes or 30 minutes, we'll also just open it up to the audience uh, so you can ask your questions um, uh, uh, or uh, um, comment. Okay. <laughs> Um, Greg uh, Fasolino uh, has been playing and writing about post-punk since 1984 when he started his fan scene Heaven Down Here. He worked for many years as a journalist serving as an editor at Reflex, Faces, The Island Ear and other magazines, um, writing for publications such as Cream, The Big Takeover, Newsday, DJ Times, uh, many others. Um, he's uh, contributed over 40 entries to the Trouser Press Record Guide, The Ultimate Guide to Alternative Music, uh, and he's written liner notes for Peter Murphy's Wild Birds. As a musician, he's played guitar for bands including The Naked and the Dead, Bell uh, Hollow, and the current, his current project, The Harrow. And if you have a copy of the book, you can see what Greg looked like back in the day on page 42. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice picture. Thank you. Yeah. Nice um, <laughs> Wish I still had that hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to keep that up, you know? Yeah. Um, Ethan Mor uh, uh is a vocalist, was the founding member of the goth band Fahrenheit 451 uh, from 1984 to 1986. He says in his bio that they only released one record, but they played every club in New York, Hoboken, and Philly. Um, they opened for, you're just like too busy to put any records out, right? <laughs> um, Specimen, uh, Jean Loves Jezebel, even the Ramones. From there, he went on to front executive slacks, followed by the dark industrial groove of the LA-based Spawn Ranch from 1993 to 2000. Um, he was signed to the seminal goth and industrial label Cleopatra, um, where he compiled and produced countless compilations, including the Goth Box. In 2009, he returned to performing when he joined the Project Records flagship gothic ethereal band Black Tape for a Blue Girl, and more recently in 2014, signed to Metropolis Records with his goth flavored synth heavy ensemble Noir. And uh, Andy Harriman, who's one of the co editors, compilers of Somewhere Leather, Somewhere Lace, um, 
holds an MFA in design. She hopes to continue researching, writing, and documenting as a 1980s music anthropologist, which makes folks from the 1980s feel really like specimens. Uh, thank you. Currently, she is a prolific DJ and runs a monthly event called Synthesize. So, welcome. Thank you. All right. So, first, let's talk about this term uh, post punk and its relationship to goth and the timeline. So, Andy, do you want to start <clears throat> talk a bit about what these terms mean to you and the yeah. time frame? Well, I, I started my project kind of just basing it on what people told me, so I made no assumptions. And from my research, I don't know, maybe you guys have different opinions, but I say in 1978, when uh, punk was coming to an end, there was people longing for something with more substance. Not to say that punk didn't have substance, but they were longing for something more. So um, after that, people started just making more melodic songs. Um, and I would say post-punk was for about six years till 1984. And then you can categorize goth into post-punk, but goth was more, um, I would say dark. That's when things got really dark, was with Sisters of Mercy and um, bands like that. People say that Sisters of Mercy kind of started the whole goth thing. Um, I don't know your opinions on that, but... Sure. Uh, well, I was... Greg and I were talking about this earlier. We didn't even hear the word goth until about... 85? Mm -hmm. Early 85. Yeah, somewhere in 85. I remember I was in Fahrenheit 451. Our keyboard player came to uh, rehearsal one night, and he said, I, I know what our band sounds like now, I know what to call it. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, people are calling it gothic. And I said, are you, are you kidding me? It just seemed like such a strange medieval word. It just didn't seem to fit really, but I, I, clearly people started using it. And so we didn't really, it was all sort of post-punk at the time, everything going on, just everything at Danceteria. I mean, you'd go, you'd go to Danceteria and it would be um, a hip hop band playing with uh, Red Lori, Yellow Lori at the, on the same night. And so it was all sort of in the same bowl. Things started to kind of splinter off after that time period, I guess about 85, 86, mm -hmm. where you kind of have what we now think of as indie and what we now think of as goth and electronic. And all these things started to sort of splinter off from that time period. But I, I think it mostly was post-punk simply because punk had been around about six, seven years at that point. And so as that was starting to fade and people were, you know, maybe wearing makeup or there was more theater being involved, I think you have the whole post-punk period after that. Yeah, I think I, I first heard the word post-punk maybe about 82. Up until then, it was just sort of all punk and new wave, alternative, and um, I, I think all the bands were, like, like Ethan said, were all kind of just lumped together. You would listen to them all, there wasn't really a big differentiation. <laughs> Um, but looking back on it in retrospect, I think the post-punk bands really were more artistic. Um, in, I think what happened though is, is I didn't really see the, the change that he's, you guys are talking about until I remember 84. Um, I was at a show and it was, it sounds bizarre now, it was Black Flag and the Sisters of Mercy doing a show together. <laughs> at the Ritz. At the Ritz, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think that was the first time I really noticed, wow, there's two totally different, the subgroups have like totally split because the two groups of fans were, it was really hostile and people were getting spit on. And I remember, you know, the Black Flag fans were spitting on Andrew Eldritch. And it was just like a real, you could tell there was a change then. There were like things that sort of splintered apart a little bit. But again, he's right. I mean, we didn't really hear the word Gothic until 85. I remember the same thing. Someone right. came in and said, we had a club we were doing at the time called Subway in Queens that was really focused on that. And someone came in one day and said, we should make this a, a Gothic night. And I remember thinking, what is that? What is that? And we just, I mean, we said the word was back cave at the time. But. Yeah. In my book, I separate into about eight, 78 to 82 as post punk, like just the very basics. And then about 82 to 84, back cave, sort of the specimen and the alien sex fiend, the very dramatic. But then it really started getting dark with Sisters of Mercy in 84. And then about 87, a lot of people say that goth died. I don't know. That's what people told me, and then and then it either went to EBM and industrial or to gothic rock, which I think is different from just goth. Can you talk about that distinction a bit? Um, 
You, why don't you say something? Well, <laughs> it, it, the way I remember it, about 87 in New York, goth really did die. Um, it really faded out. And uh, I remember I had moved to Philadelphia at the time to join this band, Executive Slacks, and we went to L.A. and played, and I couldn't believe that L.A. still had a goth scene. Like, L.A. and San Francisco were, I, I think in many ways in the United States, L.A. and San Francisco are the reason why goth is still around, because the scene actually never died there. It's still there. And for, for back then, now, I mean, it's, it's changed and mutated, but L.A. strange. There's still a ska scene. There's still a metal scene. There's still a goth scene. It's like one of the, it just never, there's a rockabilly scene. It's like you can go and L.A. has all of that. But um, I remember... Bands started playing around with electronics. Um, I mean, it had, always been, it had always been around. Newman, obviously, early Ultravox. I mean, it, people were playing around with electronics for years. But on a large scale, I think playing around with dance music and elements of goth and sort of bringing it all together, and I, I, I think you have some early industrial sort of growing out of that around, around 86, 87. Mm -hmm. So I think... But then later, I think the two scenes sort of started hanging out together because they were sort of the bastard children of alternative music. So it, they had to kind of hang out together to sort of at least create something. You got 10 goth kids, you got 10 industrial kids, and they're hanging out. And maybe there's different rooms at the club or something yeah. like that. But it's like all of the all of the black sheep hanging out together. And it's like, okay, the girl is goth, the guy's industrial, and they get married. So. <laughs> Greg, do you have anything to add to this? Uh... Um, I would say, yeah, I think there was, what he said, the, uh, the scene did sort of splinter around 87. A lot of people from that scene sort of got into, into metal um, for some reason. Sorry, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. And uh, I think the Sisters of Mercy were sort of a catalyst in that because they were different than the goth bands we were first into. They did have a more 60s and hard rock sort of feel to them. The, the hair was long instead of up. And I think people, and then you had the cult with, um, what was that album, yeah. uh, Electric, where they mm -hmm. sort of started to sound like ACDC. I think it, it sort of changed and people sort of moved on to other things for a while. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the psychedelic flashback. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so can you, can you talk a bit about, uh, you're all talking about it as a scene. Mm -hmm. um, I, I definitely think about elements of goth in the 80s also as a subculture, and I think maybe that depends partly if you're talking about an urban setting or what was happening in youth culture at the time. Um, but I guess my other question is, so what was it drawing on? So it was moving forward, it was connected to metal, it was connected to the whole alt-rock scene. But moving backwards, was it also carrying forward, I sometimes think about goth and post-punk as sort of picking up some elements of glam rock that oh, got definitely. lost in the 70s. Mm -hmm. so well, sure, Bowie, I mean, oh, definitely yeah. had a, a lot to do with that. I mean, mm -hmm. when you really think about it, I guess Bowie is kind of the, the grandfather of yeah. goth in a lot of ways, so there were, there were definitely elements of glam, but I think Greg and I would both agree on this. If you were a kid and you're into the Twilight Zone and you're into horror films and you're into some film noir and you're into comic books and stuff like that and then you become a teenager and you get into some poetry and you get into some literature, goth is a natural. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it's, it's the kind of music that, that once you hear it, you know, I mean, for me, I, I guess in some ways, when I... I in 19, when did The Hunger come out? 82? 82. When I saw, the, when I saw the Hunger, I said, what is that fucking band? Because yeah. that's what I want to do. <laughs> so, I mean, Bauhaus was in The Hunger, yeah. and to me, I, I, where has this band been my whole life? And by yeah. the time I could even track down their records, the band had already broken up. So, uh, <laughs> but to me, once you, once you identify it, I, I think that that's when you get into it. But it can defi there's definitely elements of, of Bowie, I'd even say to a certain extent, Mark Boland, T-Rex, maybe John a little Waters. bit. You know, The Doors, John, yeah, of course, you know, mm. John Waters, and, and, and when, it, when it comes to film, I mean, obviously Rocky, horror Rocky, film. Horror. Rocky you know, a horror, A lot of the yeah. original goths yeah. around here were former Rocky Horror devotees, so <laughs> I think that's like an unacknowledged influence. <laughs> so it was, it, again, like, I, if what you're saying, yeah, the dress-up element and the sort of, we didn't think of it as role-playing back then, but I guess that's what they would think about it as now. It, there's there's that whole side of it and 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 I almost feel like that the combination of that and the music and the imagery it sort of all comes together. 
And what about the affect, right? Like there's also a certain kind of emotion connected that maybe was not present in punk. Is that fair to say? Well, I think that there was, I mean, again, when you, when you think of somebody like Ian Curtis from Joy Division and suicide, and you think of Sylvia Plath and suicide and the whole morbid sort of sad, uh, forlorn elements of, of it, punk didn't have that. We all right. like punk. I mean, I, sure. I, I right. mean, we, but again, once we found something with a little bit more emotion, mm -hmm. it, it really opened things up. And was there any kind of particular, this is like a really academic question, so, but was there a particular like political reason that this shift would have happened when it did, this rejection to a certain extent of punk? Or was it purely aesthetic? In the US, I'm not so sure, but in my other research, especially in Finland and maybe smaller European countries, it was the suppression of the government. So in Russia, I have a little section where we talk about how people that were black were got, got sent to insane asylums. And with things like that, it was just going up against the government and just speaking your mind and having an identity. But in the U.S., I'm not sure. I, people really didn't speak about that. I think that. it was a little different here. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it was actually sort of a, a, not a rejection, but sort of a reaction to the way the punk scene had gotten very political and very sort of puritanical, and there was an asceticism mm -hmm. to, to it. Um, it was very much about you had to dress a certain way. It, gotten, it had gotten sort of ossified into, a, you know, you talked about the government or about oppression or whatever, and you couldn't really express anything co you know colorful not color as you know just colorful as in you know outside of this box and i think i don't know about if you would agree but i felt like when i first got into the dressing that way it felt like a liberation it felt like oh we can we don't have to just dress in t-shirts and doc martens and you know we can, and you know just this very kind of almost militaristic look that punk had gotten into around 83 and all of a sudden it was like wow we can we can do wild hair we can do you know, outrageous clothes. We can kind of express sort of a, a more, you know, I, I think it's really interesting too that it goth became associated with sort of depression, with depressive feelings because I felt at least in the beginning it seemed to be more of a, a celebration. Like we can do something more exciting than what was happening. The beauty of death. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you guys just, I, I can't <clears throat> think of a subculture that it is more uh, connected to hair. Uh, can you talk about the hair? Because I, it's amazing. Metal, metal is into hair, though. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. And there's, a, there's actually some interesting crossovers if you look through the book. How much time did you spend, because your hair is pretty amazing, Greg, in this. Um, it, it was, I would say, maybe at least a half an hour, but I wasn't, I wasn't the, the top echelon of that. I had some friends, our friend Christopher, who I was in a few bands with, he would do, I think they showed a picture of it, before of him sitting in my bedroom, yeah. he had two cans of Aquanet hairspray. And it was you had to use two cans, and he would sit there and just it would take him an hour, and he would use up both cans for one night, and his hair would be you know this high. And that was beyond. I, I didn't go that far, but some people really spent hours. Yeah. I interviewed some people. It took them six hours to get ready just to go out at night. It's like it's insane. It was like their job. It's like they didn't work, they didn't go to school, they just got ready. And so, can you talk about some of the elements of style that tied? Well, like, this well, like we kind of talked about the glam rock and the John Waters influences, definitely. And I think the hunger had a lot to do with how people dressed as well. That movie was pretty important. Um, in terms, of, I don't know what else. Um, in the period where I, I feel like we were coming up. Um, I feel like there was an element of there was like a, a spaghetti western element to it to a certain mm -hmm. degree. Well, there was like so. a Mad like Max. an Amish element. There was a, a Mad Blade Max Runner. Blade Runner yeah. sort of combination. Mm -hmm. I guess if I really look back on it, I, I guess I look kind of Amish back then. Yeah. <laughs> I, went, I went for like yeah. the Amish Heath, Heathcliff, Wuthering Heights kind of. Mm -hmm. like you were one of the first thing. people I remember in the scene to wear your hair longer instead of up. Yeah, you, I was really you kind of went yeah. for that sort of. Young Jim Morrison thing. Yeah, with the like Jim, an Amish Jim Morrison. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like my look, I guess. It, what about um, what about the makeup? Well, I guess that. I mean, the, the, honestly, that that came right out of glam. That's for sure. I yeah. mean, it, it certainly. It, there were no punk bands that put on makeup other than the Addicts. I mean, I can't think of too many punk bands that did makeup, but um, maybe Misfits. maybe some of the peace punk bands. I guess the Misfits. Yeah. Um, 
but the, the whole makeup element definitely came out of, uh, it probably was a combination of Rocky Horror and Glam Rock from a few years before, but um, it, it definitely borrowed from that world. And I, I mean, I was too young for it, but I do remember, I do remember the 70s and then even seeing films of, uh, you know, a lot of the Teddy Boys in England, you know, with, with the, the sort of the rockers, you know, there were, there were definitely costumes coming along with particular sounds of music. And I, I think I started to really see that around New York in the early 80s, like um, maybe the late 70s. And New York was a, I mean, New York was a very different place, man. When you watch the Warriors, I mean, that's kind of what it looked like. I mean, so, so you can kind of see how you know, Escape from New York and the Warriors were like, we weren't living in the rubble, but in some ways we kind of wanted people to think we were living in the rubble somehow. <laughs> Greg, do you have anything to add to do? No, I, I, I would definitely say that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and so where were, uh, where were the bars located? Well, we had CBs, a lot were in the yeah. East Village. Um, uh, there was well a little before our time. There was there was Dance Terrier uh, was crucial. Dance the mm -hmm. Peppermint Lounge, um, Max's same neighborhood. Kansas City. Uh, yeah, yep. basically the same neighborhood. They were in the village. Um, uh, Max's Kansas City had closed. I guess what maybe in the late seventies they closed. Uh, maybe eighty one. I yeah, think I yeah. never got there. So Dance Terrier was deaf. Dance Terrier, and to a certain extent, I guess for for bands, you, you had to play CBs. So I mean, we played CBs many times back then. But Dance Terrier was. You know the, the the crowning jewel at the time. They, I mean, Jeff and I, sorry, Greg and I were talking about it earlier. There, there was there was so few places for bands to play, and there were so few bars that had a musical edge that really um, you you could only play four or five places in all of Manhattan as an underground band. I mean, when you think about it, that's insane. There's probably four or five places on one block in Williamsburg to play. So, um, I think the New York music scene in general was on sort of a downward uh, era at that time. So it was kind of like there wasn't a lot of as much attention paid to New York music as there had been in the 70s or more recently. So it was kind of like we were kind of big city, but there was sort of it was kind of a backwater in terms of music. Which seemed ironic yeah, because you had you had the Ramones coming out of here, you had Talking Heads, you had Blondie, you had all the television, you had all these bands just a few years before really, but there was a quick downturn it seemed like in the in probably the 83 84 time period it seemed like and you had mentioned earlier moved. like yeah. I, I think th didn't the cramps move to LA yeah. in like 1982 or 3 and it was kind of like it seemed like there was an exodus of talent and so it was a lot harder to get any attention media wise Andy can you talk a bit about what was happening in other cities around that time other cities like other major urban centers either in the US or in Europe um I would say most eyes were on London around that time because they had the Batcave. Um, that was definitely where everything was beginning, where Specimen and Alien Sex Fiend too. I mean, I interviewed the fiends and they claimed to be the beginning of goth. Um, and I kind of believe that because they're very dramatic and their songs are very sort of morbid and dark. But um, I think all eyes were there and, and everybody else kind of followed suit. Of course, Susie and the Banshees were there. and. Sisters of Mercy started there, um, and otherwise I think, you know, Germany had a, a huge scene, um, and so did, uh, and then other places followed. It's funny, in my book, um, you know, places like Peru and stuff, they, they started a lot later. So they started in the late 80s when, you know, maybe the U.S. was in the early 80s. So it's kind of like they were all loosely connected, but starting at different points in time. In, in Germany, was it both in East and West that the, the scene was emerging simultaneously? No, West or was it a bit only, later? Really. Yeah. West I only. mean, yeah, it's, um, y I think things start taking Did we get a... GDR goth ever, or did we just skip that? Um, <laughs> um, well, my, well, my understanding of it, I mean, I, I, I was told that after the wall came down, granted, things changed a little bit, but for the most part, a lot of people in the former East, I mean, they were catching on to things very quickly, yeah. but they were pretty much into whatever they the only thing they had access to was a little bit of metal and a little bit of punk but um but once the once the wall came down things started to really change i, I think mainland europe takes a few years for things to sort of start to saturate there 84 85 but right when i was at the start of my career i remember bands coming over from europe and meeting them you couldn't really play too many places in the united states 
Bands would literally come to the United States, and even on a van tour, I mean, there were maybe five or six markets on the East Coast, and maybe and maybe a handful of markets on the West Coast. But trying to get, you could get to Chicago, but then there was a whole lot of nothing out there. So I mean, for bands, I mean, any kind of underground bands at the time, it wasn't like you just didn't, you just didn't be played maybe Dallas, and then maybe Phoenix. That's a hell of a drive. Um, so. Uh, things it took a long time, especially in the goth scene, for for there to be a full national. And it's kind of come and gone and comes and goes. But um, but now we're I, I feel like we're almost in a in a unique period now where uh, where live entertainment has kind of changed a lot. Can you talk a bit about what was driving uh, uh, the the scene at that time? Particular record labels. You've talked a bit about the venues, but record labels. Um, Publications, word of mouth. Um, I'm trying, you mean you, are you talking like '84, '85? Yeah, it was like mostly, the mid '80s. It was, yeah. fan, it was really black and white Xerox fanzines for the most part. I mean, um, propaganda. Well, there was there was propaganda, which definitely leaned more on fashion. They, mm. they were a great magazine. They were they would come out once in a blue moon. I don't seem to remember them <laughs> having a regular. It was yeah. sort of erratic. Yeah, yeah. Fred but, is actually here. Oh, wow. <laughs> in the back. Hi, Fred. <laughs> We love your magazine. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, propaganda was kind of the big like thing in it would New be York. An event right? When the issue right. Out, yeah. <laughs> there was a zine <laughs> from um, they were either from Philly or Jersey called B Side. I seem to remember them. There was sure. early alternative press was actually pretty good. Uh, help me here. I can't think of any of the magazines from that. In the very early eighties, there was New York Rocker. I guess that eighty four. So that died. Trouser um, Press, but I mean, they, they dealt with all kinds of underground thing, that, music, you know? That 82, that yeah. was done as far as a magazine and moved to books. It really wasn't a lot, it was really fanzines, so yeah. a lot. And so Andy, when you were doing research for the book, were you tapping into that printed ephemera? Were you doing interviews? You call yourself an anthropologist, so, mm. like, can you talk a bit about how you compiled this where the materials came it. from? Yeah. Uh, it's basically just begging people. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, I did initial research, and when I decided I wanted to do this, I um, I just started looking up people and just asking them. I think that's kind of been my policy for this whole project, is to ask, and the worst thing they can do is say no. So um, I just would ask them for pictures or interviews. Um, and then when I did my Kickstarter, we had a little bit of money to buy some professional photos. So what I like about this is it's, the book is that it's mixed with professional and then, you know, the original goths, their own archives, I'd like to say. Um, and then through all the interviews, I would say it was about two years of solid interviews and just it took me about another half year to, to actually write the, the script and put it all together. Um, so it's basically just begging. <laughs> Well, before, no before I throw this out to the, the floor, I just want to throw back some of your own questions to you. All right. <laughs> um, uh, speaking of the script, so we're on page 156. I should also say, if you want to see what Ethan looked like, um, I think his image is on uh, page 62 um, for the way, the way back image. So you say, most interestingly, the question remains, why did the dark scene occur in many worldwide nations at the same time, independently of each other? I, I, that's... I think a really important question, um, and I'm curious to know what all you think about that. Um, how is it possible uh, the 1980s alternative youth shared the same styles, sentiments, and music tastes, um, and the scene might have been formed locally, but the heart of the community was reflected globally? Mm -hmm. And to me, the fact that this was happening before the internet, we talked about the fanzines, we talked about word of mouth. It, it has, a, there's a sense as a really global scene, but without the media that we associate with supporting global scenes today. So let's start with this first question, which is, you know, why, why was it a world, worldwide scene when it was? How was that possible? What was driving it? I think that's one of the things that I realized when I was, when I was writing this, how did all these people have the same sentiments and they were, you know, thousands of miles apart? I. I think it really starts with punk and people were looking for something new and something with a lot more substance and more value, um, maybe a little bit more sad and dark, but honestly, I, I don't know. I think it's amazing, and I think, I think there were zines and you know people sharing, but to the grand scheme of things, I'm really not sure. I think it's amazing. I don't, 
Yeah, what do you guys think was driving this? Well, I think one thing we didn't mention that really does tie into this, we've mentioned zines, but I don't think we really talked about the influence of the British music press, because for us here, like, you, you, there was no internet, obviously, you would buy the British papers every every month, and they would really focus, because it was popular in England, they would focus on the goth stuff. So you would pick it up and you would be reading about, say, the March Violets or um, Sex Gang or whoever, and, and you would get, see the photos and you'd be like, ooh, I'd like to you know, dress like that, and you would read about what they were thinking. And I think that probably happens on a worldwide phenomenon where they could, maybe they, they didn't have their own press in all these different countries or even across the small areas of the U.S., but they could get the British, you know, any record store could get the British papers, and you could kind of see what was going on in London and then sort of adapt it yourself. I think a lot of, uh, I forgot to mention that, you, like you said, New Music Express and um, Zigzag too. A lot, a lot of the UK magazines seem to write about this, about this scene for the most part, although they probably didn't. They didn't think of it as a scene. They would write about a lot of the bands that came out, but I think a lot happened in record stores. I mean, you would go to a record store and and you'd start flipping through the bins of all the new stuff, and there'd be other kids in the record store, and you'd start bullshitting with them. And then the guy behind the counter, of course, would say, "Hey, there's a new there's a new record out, and I'm getting some stuff in on Friday." And it really was more of a word of mouth thing. And the bands would have their individual followings and. I think the bands would sort of be the, the spokespeople, I guess, for the scene, and people mm -hmm. would show up at the shows. And um, but it really was more of a. It, it's such a. It's so different now. I mean, it. it, it to th I mean, great, it's great. We're in a record store, and people are shopping and checking stuff out, and you know, tangible items. And it, it, it's nice to see that again. But it's such a small fraction of what's going on in the music scene now. But back then, it was such a huge part of things. And then, of course, you'd go to a nightclub, even on just a regular dance night, and you know people would talk, and there was a lot of one-upsmanship going on, I guess. But you'd go see other bands, you'd go see other friends' bands, and and kind of somehow organically all happened. Mm. Yeah. Um, people have questions. Yeah. Um, it seems like uh, what what you've been all saying is that. Uh, Goth was like a reaction to the rigidity and dogma and moralism of punk and was like a movement to conception and stuff like that as like a basis for musical culture or whatever. How did the return to politics come in like the early 90s with like industrial and stuff like that? Like how did it move from like uh, a non-physical uh, subculture back to politics? I I think maybe at its very since since industrial is so so ridden with angst, um, it seems like it, it has a little bit more of a uh, it has more of a political edge because it, it just seems like a you know the perfect platform for you know political based or anti-establishment I guess you could say and I I feel like maybe goth was always more atmospheric more mm. surreal yes. you know so I, I think that that's always maybe been the differences between the two mm. and especially with industrial being so so european i mean it really is when you really think about it it's very german very political very you know very angst ridden so i, I think it's a perfect platform for s speaking out about politics or stances or points of view Did like technology, like synthesizers or effects, or like I don't know, like editing platforms at the time, did that like affect like the sound or like the proliferation of bands and got? Absolutely, I think um, that was one of the main factors in the early '80s. They people just started playing with things and making songs, and and it they actually it was people made music in the studio, but now with the technology, they can make it at home. So people were just playing at home on their keyboards and their synths when they could get one, you know, and and making music, and it was more accessible to people. And I think that's where a lot of bands stem from, actually. I, I recently saw an interview with uh, one of the guys from Knights Rip, and he said, he's probably about the same age as me, and he, he, they started when he was pretty young. And uh, he said he was into punk, but there was, he liked it, but he felt like there was something missing from it, and he felt like when he 
got his hands on a synthesizer and he could express elements of punk and bring them together with synthesizers and electronics, somehow that's really where he found his voice. So he was making punk music, but instead of bass, drums, guitar, he was using a synthesizer. And so that's where it came together for him. And I think a lot of guys that started doing that in that time period, I think it's true for, for a lot of people at that mm -hmm. time. Well, and I think synthesizer kind of helped with that atmospheric sound that we all know goth to be nowadays as well. Uh, can you guys talk a little bit more about um, cinema culture and goth rock? Because I know, like in the beginning, you guys were talking about you know certain movies and certain looks. So can you elaborate more? I, I was really, I mean, my parents were crazy into movies, so I was always into movies. So, I mean, I would put, like, pictures of Peter Lorre on posters, and, you know, I mean, it just was something that I, for me, like Hitchcock movies, all of those things kind of came together, and I could, I'm, I'm not a musician, I'm just a singer, so, I mean, when I write a song, I just write a, a vocal melody. But for me, borrowing imagery from film and, and actually writing about it and writing songs about scenes and movies and things like that i mean that's where it came together for me but i had so many heroes and i i wanted to to bring them into my songs or bring them into the imagery of my records or it, it was really it was an important element for me i mean i i'm certainly not the first there's millions of musicians that do it but that's where it kind of all came together for me because i was finally able to figure out i mean how else can you jam with peter Lorre? You know, you put them on your fucking album cover or something like that. So that's that's what that's what happened for me at least. And it's such a visual. Goth is such a a visual. It's such a visual thing. And so although the the visuals in let's say the Hunger are very different than the visuals in Casablanca, I mean, it, it, they still really express themselves in a very similar way. It's a, that's how that's what it meant to me at least. I thought the book is uh, somewhere leather, somewhere late. Mm -hmm. I remember Hamish McDonald, mm -hmm. who was the DJ at that cave, used the phrase in a TV documentary in 1983. Is that where the title came from, or is it something? Yes, else? it came from the Sex Beat song. Uh, he's actually DJing my event in Berlin, so it's kind of a full circle there. Um, but yeah, I thought it was, uh, you know, a great. It, first of all, the song is great, and if you guys haven't heard it, it's Sex Beat, Sex Beat. But uh, second of all, the words have a lot to do with with what I was covering. So, and it's a nice, t it's nice. Wasn't it the only song they did too? Uh, they had a few others, but that, I think that was released on the Batcave compilation. And I think maybe they had two, two or three others, but. Yeah, in the back, yeah. What would you say the last uh, strongholds of God are geographically? The last stronghold? Yeah, the last. The, I mean, the if, when you go to, if you go to um, um, Gothic Wave Treffen in Leipzig, yeah. I mean, yeah. you'd think that Goth is the most middle of the road thing in the yeah. world. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Well it, mm -hmm. It's like literally 50,000 Goths co converge on one small German city. <laughs> uh, so I'm not saying Leipzig is a Goth town, but that time of year, I mean, it's, you just see like the trolley car go by and it's got <laughs> 50 Goths on it. I mean, it's unbelievable. So. Um, but from what I've seen, I, L.A. still has a big scene. Um, uh, San Francisco still has a pretty big scene. It's a good little scene in Seattle. Austin, of all places, if you can believe it. Um, uh, Philadelphia, oddly enough, has, still has a pretty good scene. There's a guy down there, Patrick Rogers, who really puts on really great nights. So there's, there's still some stuff going on. I would add also, it seems there's some letters and stuff I get. In addition to Germany, it seems like Spain and Italy. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. And there's a great scene in, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. Yeah. There's a great South scene. South America, yeah. Mexico, huge. Mexico City. Mm -hmm. Mexico City. In Lima, of course. Any more? Any more questions? Uh, Michelle? Yeah, Michelle. <laughs> um, towards the beginning, you mentioned um, some poetry and literature that sort of made you long for, for a turn from, um, for something more, to be more expressive. Can you talk about your personal experiences with how you maybe learned about some of that literature, and maybe some of your favorite when you were just 
turning goth. <laughs> no, the, the reason I laugh is because I, I, back then I used to think about it in such... I, I was so fucking serious about it. Yeah. I mean, when I really think, I was like, oh my God, this is... I love this shit. I mean, I, I mean, it just... It, I, I think for me back then, it, it just felt like... Um, a lot of my friends were... From college, a lot of my friends were going more... Husker do more, you know, Sonic Youth. They were going more off in that direction, and I'm going off this way with Bauhaus and with Red Lori, Yell Lori, and Specimen and Sex Gang Children. I'm going off this way, and they're going over here. And what I liked about going over here was that you, it wasn't pretentious per se. I mean, you could really be into this stuff and 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 talk about it and have people that you know that were into it over here. I mean, for me, I, I liked Emily Bronte, I mean, I liked um, Anne Radcliffe, I liked H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, I liked Poe, I mean, it was, it was really important to me, it's still important to me, but uh, Sylvia Plath, I, I, was, I, I stole a lot of lyrics from her. Um, <laughs> um, e. e. Cummings, I mean, these were really important things to me at the time, and, and part, of, part of my development, I mean, I, I just... Uh, it, lyrically, it it kind of made me who I became, I guess. So that's it was really important to me. I just have one one more question, and you know, I get the idea that it wasn't overtly political, but I also really think about post punk and goth as creating a space where. Well, women were not as marginalized as they were in punk, for sure. I think there's, and it's reflected in the book. It might just be your your, your curatorial choices, but I've always thought about it as um, there was a there was a space to challenge gender normativity, right. and it was also a really queer movement, mm -hmm. um, even if it wasn't overt. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about that. Well, I think I think what's special with goth is that you could really express who you wanted to be. And I think for a lot of people that had to be, if you're a male putting on makeup and doing your hair and spending that time like a woman would, and a lot of these people I interviewed said they watched their moms, uh, you know, getting ready to go out, and they always wanted to do that, and goth kind of gave them the outlet to do so. So they could spend all day doing their hair and makeup, coloring it whatever color they wanted, red, pink, whatever, you know, wearing dresses out, you know doing whatever they want and I think that's what was really special about goth was their acceptance to you know people who are different would you say that was the case in the New York scene or not I would say definitely so I think it I think it was a symbiotic thing because <clears throat> we had a lot of friends I think who up until that point maybe were not comfortable expressing their sexuality and being in the goth scene gave them a little bit more comfortable area to pursue that and I think it sort of Encourage them then to be, you know, more outward with their with themselves. Mm -hmm. So you could, you could be Amish, you could be gay. Yeah. Well, I think uh, well the the great thing that uh, punk wasn't very sexy. I mean, I love punk, but it just wasn't very, and it was very, it wasn't completely male. But when you go back then, when you would go to a hardcore show, it was like a dude fest. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the nice thing about about goth is that especially whether it be the bands, whether it be the crowd, the fans, there was a equal amount of men and women um, and 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 it's such a it's such a, a sexual kind of music in a lot of ways and there were so many great female fronted bands I mean in the goth scene too I mean I I think in, you had that in new wave too but I, I think in goth there uh, there was definitely room for women and, and much more so than, than punk there were some punk female punk bands of course but um, but I think Goth was a little bit more like 60s music in that there was more room for women in it, I think. Yeah. Well, I love the whole androgyny of everybody. You couldn't tell if they were male or female. Like, a lot of people already told me people, the person on the cover of the book, is that a girl? Uh, but actually, it's a guy. And I, that's what I love about goth as well as the feminine men. <laughs> I love myself a feminine man. But. Yeah, I, <laughs> there's a lot of beautiful men in this book. Yes, when many I, beautiful men. When I uh, uh, showed the book to a uh, class I'm teaching on scenes and subcultures, all the girls in the class just spend their time with beautiful men. Oh, look men. at these beautiful mm -hmm. men. It's like I had to grab the book back from them to start the class. Um, this is a book launch, so you should buy the book. There's only 600 copies it's, ever made. It's 
practically right. collector's edition. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. That was awesome. Yes, thank you, Kate. Thanks.